the third module in this lecture discusses a particular algorithm, which is a particular solution to the spatial filter problem, assuming Gaussianity of the signal. And it's, it's basically um, the most popular algorithm in the, in the whole BCI field, in fact, and specifically for oscillatory processes. So you can actually not really use this for ERPs. What it assumes, that's really important, is that you know the frequency band. It doesn't work as well if, if you don't get it exactly right, but it still works pretty well. And that you also know the time window, so you need to know when it starts and when it ends. Again, if you over or underestimate this, you will sort of suffer, but it will still sort of work. And again, it assumes that the signal is jointly Gaussian within this time and frequency window, and uh, that somehow there is a difference in how this activity is expressed between say two conditions or if you have multiple conditions between these. So in other words, that there's some information in that, in these parameters of that, um, that oscillation that is informative about what you care about. So here's what this algorithm does just geometrically. Um, I'll give you a quick idea. So say you take um, a single trial of a person imagining a left hand movement and you you just scatter plot the signal for two channels. So say this is C3 channel here, and this is C4 channel here. Um, so you take every sample in this time, two channel time series and plot you know, the excursion for one channel here and the excursion for the other channel in the other axis. What you then get is some kind of a scatter plot. Uh, so say we are plot talking about the red cloud of points here. Now these are not trials. These are samples in this one trial. You see in this case, um, this, in this condition, the data has sort of higher variance in one channel than in the other. Um, so it's, say, higher in C3 as opposed to C4. And in the other condition, it has higher variance in the other channel, lower variance in the one channel. So there's a difference in that. And also, the two channels are pretty much correlated. So whatever, it projects both to this and that channel. And there's no, um, from looking at the variances here, you can't really tell whether it's one class or the other. There's a little bit of information, but it's really not ideal. So the task now is to do a linear transform of this so that you can directly measure the variance and, uh, and, and have, get a lot of information about whether it's condition one or condition two. And so that's what this algorithm does. It designs a linear transform, a set of spatial filters, you could say, because they are linear. Um, mapping this into a new space where it's much more discriminative. And so here's what, what you would get after you apply this. Um, so you, you add your two channels first. This is the same data that we just had. After applying this method, um, same data, you get this. This is a linearly transformed version of that. Basically, the space has been squished in this axis. It's some sort of scaling. And what happened is, these are, by the way, Gaussian distributions. Um, where they turn sort of mutually diagonal, see this? And second, if I look at one channel and I look at the variance, in one case the variance is very large, in the other case the variance is very small. So it's maximally informative with respect to variance. And if I look at the other channel, actually it's the other way around. And the two are sort of independent parameters, so both of them give us information. So. Um, Basically, you can say um, the activation along this is a channel, and the parameters of the spatial filter that gives rise to this is, you know, one row in this in this linear transform or so. So there's a bunch of ways to calculate this. I, there, there are basically three major ways. Uh, you know, you can kind of set it up as an optimization problem. I can just only real quickly give you the intuition of this. Um, you. If you're looking into the literature, you see this formulation a lot. It basically says this. The signal is jointly Gaussian, so you can basically calculate the covariance matrix of the signal in one condition, and you've completely characterized it. There's no more information in that, and stationary and so on. And so there is two covariance matrices here. Covariance matrix in class of one, minus 1, say, left, and covariance matrix average in class two. It's two matrices. They characterize basically um, this versus that distribution, um, so to speak. And um, C can be either plus one or minus one. You can set it up either way. Uh, 
this one is an optimization problem. It optimizes um, this term here subject to a constraint. And um, this little term where you take a spatial filter and you multiply it before a covariance matrix and then take the same spatial filter after it, um, if you apply that, that gives you a value that's equivalent to taking a signal, applying the spatial filter, and then calculating the variance of the spatial filtered signal. It's a way to look up, basically, from a covariance matrix, what the variance is in any direction, so to speak, in space. So we're trying to optimize W such that um, this term is maximum, so that the projected variance is maximal. Now I can just make these all infinities, the, the you know, components in W, and then I have maximum variance for sure. And that's why there's this extra constraint. The constraint says, and if I take the average covariance matrix, sum of both classes, and spatially filter it, uh, I get 1. Uh, so the average covariance um, should be 1. But looking at the covariance, same spatial filter for one class, it should be maximum. So consequently, it must be minimum for the other class. Um, and that's sort of the intuition behind that. So uh, that is actually a solvable optimization problem. When you look at that, it turns out whatever direction you look at, the variance of this is <laughs> actually 1. And you know, um, there is some direction uh, where uh, you know, the variance for one is still you know, maximum. And necessarily, the variance for the other must be minimum because it sums to one. So that's what this thing solves. That's one way to do it. And the reason why there's a C is uh, you have one optimization problem which gives you kind of this axis, and the other solution spatial filter gives you that axis. OK. There is another way to do it as a generalized eigenvalue problem. That's actually the most efficient way. I just, um, I'll not discuss the math, but I'll tell you that you can basically do it in one line in MATLAB. So you know, this is a way to, to write up generalized eigenvalue problems. Uh, it basically jointly diagonalizes um, you know, uh, this covariance matrix and the average covariance matrix. And out comes um, you know, eigenvectors and um, and eigenvalues. And these things are actually your spatial filters. So um, there's a good deal of literature um, on that as well. Although the trouble is um, the proof for why these things work, um, why you can translate it to a generalized eigenvalue problem, require a little bit of analysis. So there's some Lagrangian multipliers in there and so on. And the third way is some geometric way. It's a multi-stage analysis, uh, also analytical, which says, um, it's perhaps the most intuitive, actually, which says, so I have these distributions. You know, I have the green distribution, the red distribution, um, and I can look at the average distribution as well. That's the blue one. If I take the principal components of this, I actually get these vectors here in the, the blue vectors. And uh, the associated you know, lengths or so are the, the length of these vectors. If I... Um, transform the data into this coordinate system, the blue one, I get here. You know, um, So basically, the data has been rotated and has been scaled so that um, you, know, you have unit variance in all directions. After this um, whitening step, now the data is uniformly um, you know, unit variance. Actually, that is the thing that already diagonalizes the two underlying um, distributions. So you see they are diagonal. And the reason is if you have two distributions that are not diagonal, in one axis you have more variance than in the other. Um, they can only be diagonal so that you can be unit variance in all directions. So whitening, that's just PCA, basically, um, in a sense. The only problem is in this, you, there's no axis, really, um, where you can read out something that's informative with respect to variance. You know, um, so there's sort of the same variance in this axis for one class and the other, and it's the same for this. You have to rotate it into, you basically have to rotate it into either the red or the green coordinate system. If you do that, wh which we did here, um, there you can look it out, up. You can directly read it out. You see, so for example, green variance is low and red variance is high. So it's a, it's a two step thing whitening, rotation. And uh, to get these coordinate systems here again, you, it's again a PCA, basically. So you have one PCA of the average, and then you have a PCA in, rotate, in whitened space of this. So that can also be written down in something like two or three lines of um, MATLAB. 
when you run this and plot the spatial filters, you get something like what we already saw earlier. Um, you get, actually, you know, um, these things happen to produce multiple spatial filters. You know, they give you a whole matrix. And so there's much of stuff that we can plot. Uh, and some of them are going to have maximum variance for one class, and others are going to have maximum variance for the other class. That's why some of them emphasize one side of the brain, and others emphasize the other side of the brain, left versus right. Um, and then, since there's many more vectors, and many of them are sort of in between, there's sort of a fall off of, you know, this vector is orthogonal to this one. It's still high variance, but not quite as high variance for one class, and so on. Uh, so this is probably most informative, second most informative, third most informative um, with maximum variance for one class. And this is most informative, maximum variance for the other class, second most, third most, and so on. It's just a way in which these things are plotted. And uh, so for all these spatial filters, you can also plot the forward projections by just taking this matrix, which is in fact full rank, but I didn't have enough space for the plots, and inverting it, and then plotting it. So we already discussed this kind of um, picture before. And so now we have the Ws. And now we can calculate the spectral features in the source space. And now we can just apply a classifier, linear classifier or whatever, to classify these features. Um, and that gives rise, so that's just applying LDA to the features, you know, log variance. So basically what you do to predict the class for a new trial is you take the data x, a single trial, apply the spatial filters that you learned using CSP. So now you get new time courses, maybe six or so. Then you take the variance of that. These time courses, now you get six values, say, if you restricted it to the most informative six. Take the logarithm of the variance to make it a little bit more Gaussian distributed, and then apply a linear classifier. And in this case, it's just actually the exact same chunk that we had in LDA before, you know, in the ERP lecture. So you could have used support vector machines here. You could have used a nonlinear classifier. But this one is already going very far. So that is really the, the direct implementation of this graphic model that I showed. And if you are now plugging it all together into a full BCI, what you have is input data, filter graph. The filter graph is just a band pass filter, because you need to sort of restrict it to this informative frequency band. And then uh, in a sliding window of the output, this is your x, basically, this matrix, you apply this prediction function. And so uh, if you manage to get the frequency band right and all that, you're, um, you basically have a working BCI. And so that's um, the end of this little CSP module. And we'll look into some more generalizations of that in the next module.